Good morning. It is an absolute joy to be with you all this morning. And if you would, turn in your Bibles with me to Romans chapter 1. Last week, we did an overview of what to expect in our study of this wonderful book. And this morning, we are actually beginning in the verses uh, that we'll walk diligently through in the, in the days ahead. And we're going to be digging more fully into each verse as we do so. This morning, we're going to be in our first seven verses of Romans chapter 1. And this is something that is oftentimes easily overlooked in our study. We recognize that it's a, a salutation or an introduction uh, to this letter. It's, it's the author, Paul, simply saying to the recipients, the churches in Rome, uh, hi, hi. This is who I am. This is what I want you to know. Those types of things. And, and oftentimes it's just considered, we would consider it in our day a, a mere formality. It's something that we would scan over and say, oh, okay, uh, I know who it's from. When you open the letter, when you first see it, okay, this was from Paul. Uh, that means this or those things. And this would, this would be accurate in our view of Scripture, in our view of these first seven verses if it weren't for the duality of the authorship of Scripture, when all of it is profitable. One of my favorite things that we've been able to do in some of our studies is, for example, in our study of Matthew's Gospel, when we went through the genealogy, and we got to see the purpose and the grace in the book of Genesis, when we went through multiple genealogies and got to see why they are profitable for each of us. In the same way, these first seven verses are not a mere formality. There's purpose and profitability in them for each of us who are brothers and sisters with Christ before the Lord. As we begin this introduction, I will tell you that, that the book of Romans does not really allow us to dip our toes in and get a taste of it. Rather, we're plunging almost immediately into the depths of the deep end where we're going to stay for the majority of our time in the years ahead of this study. This morning's sermon title is directly from verse 1, and we've called it the good news of God or the gospel of God. Read with me as Paul introduces himself and declares this as his mission in Romans 1 verse 1. Paul, a bond servant or slave of Christ Jesus called as an apostle set apart for the gospel or the good news of God. Here we have Paul's description of himself to start us off. And, and I started there and didn't go into the rest of it because we're not going to spend much time here. And I'll confess to you ahead of time why that is. I've promised Pastor Ransom that he will be able to walk with you all more thoroughly through Paul, the man and his ministry in July. I promised him I would not undercut him uh, in his preparation for that. So this morning I'm going to simply point out three characteristics of Paul that he declares here in verse 1 that will help set the tone for this letter in our study even this morning. He says first and foremost that he is a slave of Christ. It's interesting that second only to his name, that's the, what he wants people to know about him as they receive this letter. Paul, a bondservant or a slave of Christ Jesus. And in this, we have so much understanding of the Christian faith. We can argue, I think, with, with great success that Paul was likely the greatest Christian ever and he says simply by way of introduction that he, Paul, is first and foremost a slave of Christ. That's who he is. This is what summarizes him. This is what he wants people to know about him. Now remember, this isn't like an email. This is a letter that was, that was written, sealed, given to Phoebe, and traveled over a thousand miles. This isn't something that was instant that could receive a response, that he could respond and say, oh, well, I would want you to know this. Everything in it, not only is it inspired by the Spirit, but it's also given with Paul's purpose. And this is what his purpose was. And I wonder if we modern Christians have this as the preeminent thing about ourselves. Do we consider that, that the most important or the foremost thing about us is that we too are slaves of Christ? This was the Apostle Paul. Again, arguably the greatest Christian that ever lived. An example where he himself says, follow me as I follow Christ. And this is what he says about himself. And secondly, he says that he is a, a called apostle. Now, 
We need to read that rightly. It's not that he is called an apostle, but that he has been called as an apostle. In other words, this was not a designation that Paul took upon himself, as so many have tried to do since then. It was placed upon him by one greater than himself. It set him apart. We see this in passages like Ephesians 2, where he says that the apostles are the foundation for the church, Christ himself being the cornerstone, and that we are the blocks which make it up or build it. There is a set apartness specific to this office of apostleship that was designated upon 13 with very specific designations upon them. They had to be those who were taught specifically by the Christ and were eyewitnesses of the resurrected Christ. And only Paul is the one that followed after that uniquely by Christ's own hand fulfilled that when the resurrected Christ appeared to him upon the road to Damascus and taught him specifically the things that were needed. It was a special or, or specific fulfillment. Paul himself says, I am the least and the last of all the apostles. And it's important that we recognize this, that in all areas of God's design, that there's a calling upon them, a calling out. It's not something that a person simply says, well, I feel that I ought to be. I have a desire to be. I want others to see me as, and therefore I am going to take this designation upon myself, whether it be deacon, whether it be uh, elder, whether it be pastor, whether it be apostle, what, any of those things throughout the history of God's giving, Paul says this has been set apart, set upon by someone greater than oneself. And from the beginning, this struggle from men has been a plague of Satan visited upon God's people. That men would raise themselves to a position or a title and then convince those with itching ears and naivety that it was in fact true about them. The greatest mark of the Apostle Paul, when you read through his, his text and what was declared about him, his epistles and other things, was his humility. He was the chief of sinners by his own hand. He was the least of all the apostles. By his own hand, he records these things. That, that all that he was in this life was only by God's mercy and God's choosing. Nothing Paul did. He was a persecutor of the church, a hater of Christ, and God yet saved him. Brothers and sisters, we would all do well to cultivate this protective view and posture that Paul sets forth. In thinking on that, I read a, a story told by a, a pastor in Philadelphia many years ago. He's now since home with the Lord. And he doesn't say where he heard it. I'm not sure if he was an eyewitness to this or if it was simply relayed to him. But it was about a little country church with an old black preacher who had faithfully preached truth and served God year after year amongst that flock that was there. And one day, a young preacher was there visiting and preaching. And apparently... His feelings that he was destined for greater things than this poor country flock was evident both from his attitude and his teaching. And after he had finished, the old preacher went up to him and said, Son, was you sent or did you just win? And I think that there's a key to understanding how this, this looks. This, this is a plague upon our faith. It's not a write-off. When Paul says that this is what we need to know about him, that he is called as an apostle. This is a caution that a man is called by God or else he's not been sent. If a man's not called out by God, he's not sent at all. And thirdly, Paul introduces himself as one who is set apart for the gospel of God. Again, this is a great distinction to recognize that if a man would bear the burden of preaching... He must be set apart to a single message. Hey, Paul says this repeatedly, that he, he's resolved to preach nothing but Christ and him crucified and all that that carries with it. There would be a single message. It's interesting, the term for preacher in the Greek is a term that simply means one who is a herald. And if you know anything about history, one who is a herald in a kingdom is one who simply goes about declaring the message of the king. And if you can imagine that, if you have any recognition of that, maybe from movies or, or from other studies you've done, imagine for just a moment, if a herald of the king were to go to some town, for example, and say to those who are there, Hear ye, hear ye, I have a message from the king himself, and he declares that you, 
And then he tells them something like, must pay a tribute unto me. Or must do these things in accordance with. And it's not the message the king gave. The herald is speaking on his own authority according to his own desires and expectations and other things. What is the king going to do when word returns to him of this herald? If you know your history, you know the answer. And so Paul says, this, I'm set apart under this to teach this one thing. I'm set apart to teach God's message, God's gospel, this good news. And what is the good news of God that Paul is set apart unto? Well, the only answer that, that can suffice is the gospel. Paul is set apart unto the good news of God, but in order to understand that, and this is where we're going to embark, we have to understand this theme of our book that's given to us, the gospel of God. We have to ask the question first, if this is about the good news of God, well, what is the bad news of man? There is bad news regarding man. We recognize that. I'm a grandfather now thrice over. And more than that, I feel a, a grandfatherly protection over all those who are in this church, especially the children. And while this is certainly physical in nature, we are careful, we are guarded, we, we put in place all measures to physically protect our children and even one another. Make no mistake, the greatest protection that we bear the weight of is the spiritual eternal condition of all who are here. When we think about this, and especially now as a grandfather, I recognize children born into this world, they're born into bad news. We don't like to think that way, but if we pause for a moment and think about it, it's true. The majority of what we hear, see, experience, and will hear, see, and experience until the return of Christ is bad news. And this world is, is, is ravaged by evil and suffering and death. We, we hear it, we try to distance ourselves from it, but it keeps pushing in. We keep hearing of it and more and more. And what I want us to understand is, is those things, as, as bad as they are, as in our face as they are, they're just symptoms of the greater malady. The greater malady that every single human being faces. And that malady is sin. I don't think we oftentimes equate this rightly. When we look at all that's going on in the world, understand all that's evil, all that's broken, all that is suffering and all that is death and all that is the things which we want to avoid and hate, all those things are brought about by sin. All are sinners, therefore all sin. And brothers and sisters, sin destroys. Yes. We want to make it less than. And what this means is that the problem that our world is, that we see around us, these are problems that are all brought about by us. And we don't like that. Do we? We don't like that we're the problem. We don't like that's the offense of the gospel that we ourselves are so broken that the only fix is that God's own son would have to die on our behalf. That we're that broken that nothing else would do. We don't like this. We, we want to blame someone else. It's the nature of who we are. Left to our own devices, we will always do that. You don't believe that? Walk over to the children's church and just ask a few questions. Well, did you? Yeah, but they did it first. Yeah, but did you? Yeah, but, but it wasn't my fault. That's the nature of how we come into this world. You don't teach your children to be deceitful. You don't teach your children to, to bite one another and be selfish. You teach them not to do that. They come preloaded with all that in them. And we want to find a scapegoat as we grow up. We want to look around and say, listen, this world's broken, but it's not my fault. We want to say, here lies the fault. The reason for all this bad news. It's, it's those, those pesky Muslims. It's those wicked uh, liberals. It's this, it's that. It's the capitalist to some, it's the socialist to others, the communist to many, the conservatives, the liberals, the feminists, the hippie, the soldier. And on and on it goes. This world would just be better if it wasn't for them or their beliefs or how they act or how they do. And what we don't recognize is the problem, the bad news about man at its core is that it's in each of us. Right. What makes it broken? All of us are selfish. All of us are proud. We make our own problems. And then we blame others who have the same problems, meaning that they are selfish 
and prideful. But they present it differently, so it doesn't look like our problems, right? We look like those who are conservative, selfish, and prideful, but those who are liberal, also selfish and prideful, but because they view it this way that it's our fault, and we view it this way that it's their fault, we just end up blaming the other and never looking at ourselves. And the cycle just continues, and the world just gets worse. And it just keeps breaking. And we want to believe if we could just go back to the Reagan era, if we could just go back to the 50s and the idyllic times of things. And I don't think you fully realize the 60s happened because the 50s weren't that great. If they were that great, it wouldn't have happened. Right? And we begin to believe, well, if this would just have happened, this would have been better. And everyone starts thinking we're going to fix this and we don't fix it. Certainly, we can look around at some point and understand that what is broken about this world, we do not have the means to fix in and of ourselves. But we don't see it, and the cycle just continues. Man's lusts are ultimately the undoing of every good pursuit, every one of them, because they always promote, promote and protect self until eventually we're all alone and miserable. Because we've only protected and promoted self. And then we want to blame someone. Anyone but, well, self. Some of the most hateful human beings that have ever existed are those who claim to want peace. And the things they do in the name of peace is everything but. Because they want it through their own belief system. I want peace, but I want it my way. I want peace, but I want everyone to agree with me to do it this way. The least tolerant men and women of our day are those whose rallying cry is tolerance. I'm tolerant, just not of that. Just not in that area. I'm tolerant, but that's not true. Your tolerance is not, and it just goes on. And we look around at our world, the truth is there is really no good news. Have you noticed that? If you haven't, it's hard for me to even believe I'm saying this. I don't encourage you to watch the news. But if you're not sure about what I'm saying, watch the news. And even if you think, well, well, there's some good news, does it last? Is there any good news that's lasting? That you can, you can say, this is good, it's, gonna not, it's not changing, I can stand on it, be confident. Is there anything that comes through the news cycle that you look and say, wow, peace in the Middle East, that's going to last? <laughs> really? We, we, we see these things and we think, if we could just get there, but it never lasts. How about healing good news? Are we clear on this? Listen, I'm not saying that a desire to heal cancer is something that ought not to be pursued with all medical ability. But I want to tell you this in case you haven't become aware. Even if we cure cancer, we're all still going to die. There are limitations. There's no lasting good news. There's no healing good news. And that's the cycle of brokenness that we find ourselves in until inevitably we ask the questions, is there any good news? Is there anything worthy, anything greater, anything that lasts, anything that's permanent, anything that can heal and it doesn't go away? And the answer is yes, there is. But, but really good news of the kind we're talking about has to be that which is not tainted by man's sin, by man's selfishness and man's pride. It has to come from outside of us. And that is why the good news that Paul has given his life to is from God. The gospel of God, the good news of God. It's outside of you and I. It's untainted by our sin. This is what Paul is focused on in this book of Romans. We we spent our time last week kind of seeing where it's going to take us. But remember this about Paul himself. He had spent his time fighting against all that threatened his view of good. I think about what we know about Paul in his life, especially as Saul. There was a measure as a Pharisee and a Jew among Jews, born of the tribe of Benjamin, that we can confidently know that he hated Gentiles and their idolatry and pagan immorality. This was a grave reality of their day. To the degree that, think about Peter. Peter could not get his mind wrapped around it. He didn't want to go to Cornelius, but the Lord sent him anyhow. When he brought Cornelius back, he said to those who were there, I don't know what to tell you. I would not have done this, but God did. And what can we say about God? Then later, Paul had to still, many years later, call him out for the way in which he was treating the Gentile believers in the presence of the Jewish believers. 
For, for years, Paul had spent his time fighting against that which threatened his good. And then he turned from that unto his own fellow Jews when they were becoming Christians, and Christianity became the great focus of his hatred for a season. Where he was going about muttering threats and kicking in doors and arresting and executing Christians. But on the road to Damascus, he was forced to consider it through the lens of someone else's eyes. Through God's eyes. He had to look at himself and recognize that it's not about what Paul thinks is good. Paul got it wrong. And Paul was pursuing those things with ways that were in contradiction to who God is. He came to know that the struggle was himself. It wasn't those wicked pagan Gentiles. It wasn't those pesky Christian Jews. It was Paul. And he saw that. And in that moment he realized that there was only one who was good. There's only one source of true good news. Lasting good news. And it was through God. Whom the only real good news could come. And then he realized, in fact, it had come. It had arrived. And so Paul introduces himself in the way he did in verse 1. And then he gives us several elements of this good news or this gospel of God that he's about to embark to impart to all of us. This travels into many years ahead for us. It travels into multiple chapters of this. But even in the salutation, Paul lays the foundation to us. Read with me verses 2 to 7, and we'll spend the rest of our time here this morning. And even as I told you, it is the deep end of the pool. Please know it's also just a teaser for everything that is to come. Romans 1, beginning in verse 2. This gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh, who was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, according to the Spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his name's sake among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. To all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Here we find Paul doing what Paul does. And I believe it's the best approach, the best way to approach it is through the lens of the questions Paul is answering. What are the great, great questions of humanity, the great questions of all humans who are under the malady of their sins, subject to the brokenness of life under the sun, subjected to the futility which God himself subjected it, in hope that we would look beyond it? What are the questions that, that come up in light of this? Well, number one, well, how do we know about this good news of God? I get asked this all the time. Well, how do you know that your good news is the right good news? How do you know that your good news is, is, is right and this one is wrong? How do, we, how do we know about this good news or gospel of God? Number two, how can this actually be accomplished? Okay, God has a desire to give good news. This world's broken. I, I don't argue with you on those things, but, but how, how can this be accomplished? How can a man actually be made right with God? And this is a great question. Number three, after we learn that, the question will be, wait a second, is that enough? Is that enough? Is it sufficient what you're telling me? And, and you'll see this again. We're going to get the teaser this morning, but this will be the subject matter of the many chapters ahead of us. And then finally, well, if that is where you know about it, if that is, an, if that is how it's accomplished, and if it's enough, well, then what does it do for me? What does it mean for me, to me, about me, and those are common questions. Those are things that if you've ever shared the gospel with someone, these questions come up. When we talk about the gospel of God, these are the questions that Paul is answering, even in this salutation, this introduction that we're in. And they're great questions. They still are plaguing man in a state of despair brought on by the descending cycle of sin by which all are gripped. There is no good news. And then someone comes and says, oh, but there is. There's good news and it's God's good news, so it's not subject to the limitations that we see in all the things we think are good news here. I believe when you think through this, we're prone to say, I think my way works, but I can't find those who see it my way. And then when I find those who do, they're not enough. And so when we share that we have good news, these are the natural questions that each of us have, that every human being should ask. 
And here Paul lays out a brief answer for each of them. Number one, let's start with how, how do we know about this good news? Well, where did you get this good news? This is a righteous question. I've been asked this before when sharing the gospel. How, how do you, how, where did this come from, this good news of God? How did you hear of this? How do you know this to be true? What's your standard of it? And my answer is very simply, well, because God himself told us. Because God himself told us. Look at verse 2. Which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. I don't know if you understand this, but, but even as God has allowed Satan as a roaring lion to have a measure of his way with this world, he's, he's on a leash. There are limitations to the counterfeit that Satan can do, to the, to the things which he can accomplish. These are listed throughout Scripture, and so he presents counterfeits, but there's limits. And you'll see that there's no other religion in the world that has prophecy fulfilled as a part of what it believes. There's not one. There never has been, and all the counterfeits that have been produced, and all the counterfeits that are still being produced, and all the ways in which they're being visited and fostered upon those who are both naive and in rebellion, not one of them has prophecy which has not only been spoken, but then also fulfilled. Some will claim that, and they'll say, well, but it says in the Quran that this was going to be done, and we see this happening, but it's very vague. It's not the same in any respect of those things. Now, think about this, and, and what does that breed oftentimes in, in our modern ears? Well, it's a very common thought among men and women of our day that the God of the Old Testament is a very different God from the one of the New Testament. I hear this all the time. That God of the Old Testament, he was just full of wrath. I like the New Testament God better. I, and I just think to myself, um, have you ever read it? Like, that's a distinction that does not find itself on the pages of Scripture. That's something man came to, concluded, and desired to pursue after. Some break it down as there is the God of the Jews versus the God of Christianity, or the God of the Christians. And this is utterly wrong. Paul tells us right here in verse 2 that this is wrong. The good news of God that is the gospel of God is something that throughout the thread of the entirety of the Old Testament was before us. The good news of the New Testament did not suddenly appear in the New Testament, nor is it at odds with the God of the Old Testament. No, the good news of God has been promised by God, the one true God from the beginning of man's malady. Hey, consider this, through the seed of woman, Eve would come forth one who would crush Satan's deceit and make things right again. As soon as man fell, in sin, as soon as death and suffering and brokenness entered the world through the choice of mankind, God made this promise in Genesis 3, verse 15. I will put enmity between you and the woman, speaking to the serpent, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. This good news will come through a woman that's going to crush and, and restore that which is broken. More than that, a little bit later in Genesis, we're told that it's going to come through a nation, but in so doing, it will be a blessing to all the nations of the world. Genesis 12, verses 2 and 3. And speaking to Abraham, I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, and so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. And so we see the promises of God that bring good news to man's bad news was promised to come through the seed of Eve and through the nation of Israel. But we're also recognizing that this good news would not be for Israel alone. They're estimated on the pages of scripture to be well over 300 prophecies specifically concerning Jesus and the majority have been fulfilled in his first coming. We just looked, for example, at him riding into Jerusalem on, the, on the, the foal of a donkey and considered the sovereign hand of God in accomplishing that and the means and ways in which he did. Even if you knew this prophecy had been made and you were striving to somehow fulfill it, it would not have been possible for Jesus to choose his place of birth, for Jesus to choose the things declared about him, for Jesus to choose the outcomes, for the many, many things that were promised about Christ to come to pass in Christ. 
This is again laying the doctrinal foundation for the unity of the church through Jesus. Because it's pointing out that the good news from God was not a new Gentile reality. Remember we talked about a major purpose of Paul in writing to Rome, to the church in Rome, was to bring about the unity to the preservation of the unity which the Spirit had brought, brought through the gospel to both Jews and Gentiles that was sorely lacking in the early church and most certainly lacking in this area as we looked at last week. It's not something new. It had been promised to and through the nation of Israel for millennia prior. Well, when, so when people say, where did this good news come from? Where did, where did this happen at? Well, God's been telling us. It's not new. It's, it's something that he's been preparing us for since bad news entered the picture. Now, I love the accounts of men who set out to prove the good news of God false or, or wrong. There, there are many accounts of men who have done this over the, the history of time, over the history of, of, of the Lord being before us. So Whether it was, I'm going to prove the resurrection false or I'm going to prove one man set out to prove the conversion account of Paul False, because Paul bore such weight upon the New Testament, upon our understanding of Christianity, that if they could disqualify that, then the rest of it would tumble. And these two men together set out at the same time to do so, to, to prove wrong. They were both investigative type reporters uh, who had authored several books before, and this has been a couple hundred years ago. And in so doing, guess what happened? Both of them were soundly converted because of their study. Here's the point. Do not be ashamed of the gospel because it can stand the scrutiny. This is where we sometimes grow up. People say, well, I'm not very good at apologetics and other things. All you need to be able to say with certainty is how the Lord saved you. Start there. Share that truth. And you say, well, people don't listen. They didn't listen to Jesus oftentimes. Well, people don't like it. They didn't like Jesus. Right? There's a measure where you're measuring your experience through a lens that was never yours given to measure. Right. Don't be ashamed of the gospel because it can stand the scrutiny. I love that scene. We looked at it recently on Resurrection Sunday. The ladies at the tomb and the angel said to them, come and look for the tomb is empty. Don't just take my word for it. Come, come look inside. He's not here for he is risen. We would do well to do the same. Labor to answer the questions according to the word. The second question Paul answers is, well, if that's where it came from, okay, how did he do it? How did God, because it's not clear in the old covenant exactly how he's going to do it. There's this idea that someone from the seed of David is going to come and restore Israel to its rightful place. That there's going to be a man who's born of a woman who's going to come and be a great leader of the people and is going to overthrow whoever it is that's, that's got them under their thumb at the time of Christ. It was Rome. And that this one was going to come and be the next Moses and lead them into greater things and, and all of that. And there's this idea, but how, how is he actually going to do it? It's another wonderful and necessary question. And Paul has a ready answer. The only answer. Look at verse 3. Concerning his son. Who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh. In other words, it's the truth of God's gospel or God's good news that he sent his son to take on flesh and dwell among us. He's been promising that through the seed of a woman, through the nation of Israel, and the line of David would come forth one. The Messiah. All this pointed to a man being the good news of God. That was the understanding of all who read the Old Testament, all who followed the Old Testament, all of the nation of Israel was looking to one who would come through the line of David, born as a man, knowing that he would be a man, and as a great leader would become king forever over those things. It's easily traced. It's really not in any great question that Jesus of Nazareth was from the line of David. The big shock, the one that rocked everybody's boat and is still doing so, is that he was no normal man. He wasn't simply one who had great charisma. He wasn't a man who was simply blessed by God to do great things. No. And this is the great struggle that faces us in so many ways today still. Many claim to believe in everything about Jesus except for his deity. He was a wonderful man. He was a great prophet and teacher. I've heard him recently called a revolutionary who greatly impacted this world. Usually around Easter, 
I'll start seeing magazines at the grocery store or other places pop up with, with things about Jesus. And so as I'm standing there waiting, and, and I'll read a little bit of them, and it's somewhat amazing, and not in a good way, the way in which it's tried to explain away the truths of Christianity regarding this carpenter from Nazareth. There are many today who, who may claim that the blessings of faith and Christianity, but claim that they can do so without Jesus being God's actual son from heaven in eternity past, but instead he's just a, a greatly blessed man. And, they, and they'll say, but we believe the same things and, and, and we believe he's able to save us. That You have to believe in Jesus to be saved. That is false in every respect. Consider Paul's words. This is not Paul's view. Listen to what Paul said in Philippians chapter 2 regarding this. Regarding Christ, he said this, beginning in verse 6, who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, to be clutched, to be held on to. But he laid it aside or emptied himself, taking the form of a slave and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that in the name of Jesus every knee will bow, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It is not Paul's view that the term begotten in regards to Christ means that he was created. That's not what Paul says. It says that he existed eternally with God, but did not clutch it for our behalf, but laid aside the glory which is his and took on human flesh. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. That he was made in the likeness of men, that he found an appearance as a man. He humbled himself. He chose it. I'm so excited for tonight in our communion service. We're going to look more fully about how the love of God is displayed through his son, Jesus Christ, and how that then affects us and our love for Christ that's been given to us. There's no way to see this through any lens that's not unbiblical to conclude that Jesus was simply a great and blessed man. He was much much more than that. Those who claim to believe in Jesus as a great man for their salvation have no answer for the third question, which naturally arises. How is that enough? How is it enough that this great man died? How is that enough? I mean, I'm, I'm a sinner. I know that I've sinned before God's standard. How is the death of this man, Jesus, sufficient to do that. I mean, there have been many great men throughout history who have accomplished many great things at great personal sacrifice. We look up to them. We record them in history books. We, we think of them. We put their names and faces and different things around our country and on our money and in different ways that we would be reminded of the way in which they did these things. Why is Jesus the good news from God himself regarding man's bad news or man's despair? Well, Paul answers that one in verse 4. Who was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, according to the Spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord. What Paul says in verses 3 and 4 is the essence of, of a great mystery, right? It, it, is, it, is, it is difficult to understand the fullness of deity robed in frail flesh. It is uh, something that we don't have a category in our own experiences to say, oh, I understand that. But what we do know is that he was a man just like us in the flesh. He truly became human. This is true. He had to in order to suffer death. Hebrews walks greatly through this, and we spent a good deal of time last year doing so. But understand this. He was like no other man ever. Jesus was not a humble version of Alexander the Great. Jesus was not a, a suffering version of George Washington. Jesus was not in any sense a great man. He's the opposite of that. 
by design, intent, by prophecy and preparation. He was born in a manger. He was born in Nazareth. Now, we don't fully understand that, but we can say with clarity that it was not a great thing. By his own disciples, when they were first called to him, one of them said, can anything good actually come from Nazareth? Right? God sent him to the lowliest of places in the lowliest of ways. And he told us ahead of time that he was going to do that. He was born like every other man. But he was like no other man ever. Not, not one. He wasn't even, people say, well, he was like Adam. He was born without a sin nature. Yes, but he was not like Adam. In any respect, there is no other man ever in the history of mankind who is even remotely like this Jesus. It's a great question that needs to be answered. When you consider the world in which we live, if you've ever shared the gospel, and I pray that you have shared the good news of your own conversion by faith in Christ, I pray that you've done that. And if you have, you've been faced with these questions. You've experienced people saying, I, just, I don't know. I, just, I don't know. How do, how do you know that your good news is the right good news? That's a question that you'll be faced with if you haven't been. You'll be faced with, well, well, okay, let's just say that you are right. Tell me about it. How, how exactly is this eternal life, this, this hope, how, how is this accomplished? Oh, well, okay, so you're saying that I just, I just have to believe, but I believe in what? The historical accounts of Jesus? No, that's not sufficient. How do you know it's not sufficient? Well, because there were many there who were witnesses. Remember this, the, the high priest, the other religious leaders of the day that put Christ to death and posted a guard over him being eyewitnesses to all that happened at the crucifixion that's recorded for us. More than that, these same men received the eyewitness account from the guards they had posted of what had in fact happened, that Christ had exited the grave. And the answer was not, let me humble myself and believe because of the historical truth that's before me. It was, how do I cover this up and maintain my view of the world that I'm striving to have because it's my hope? We have to understand rightly that this is necessary truth. We can't gloss over it. We can't say, well, I, you know, he was a great man and all that. Sure, but he's more than that. But I don't really understand. No. We've been given this truth so that we might understand it. So that at the core of who we are, at the bone of who we are, we would be unchanging, unshifting in the face of the pressures of this world and the struggles of our own flesh. Amen. Paul wrote to the church in Galatia and said, y'all are not doing well. With this gospel that you've received, you are turning from it. You are turning to something lesser. You are returning to that which is lesser than. And he makes this declaration in the beginning of chapter 1 about them turning to, a, to another gospel as though that were even possible, as though there were even another gospel that existed and there's not. And he says, you have to know this to the depth of who you are so that even if I, Paul, or an angel from heaven were to declare to you a gospel contrary to the one that which you received, you would be able to refute it. Brothers and sisters, do you know the gospel of Jesus Christ to the degree that if an angelic being appeared in your bedroom tonight and told you something different, you would be able to refute it? Paul says we must know it in that way. We must persevere to grow in grace and knowledge that it's been given to us that grace and knowledge regarding Christ is sufficient for everything in life and godliness this is an important truth if you don't think so consider how missing go find a time magazine or whatever other magazine wrote anything about Christianity this year and read what the world is writing believing and pursuing in regards to this man the Christ Jesus and understand, this is not something that we can gloss over. Right. To understand what it means that he is fully God and fully man. You know what that does when we begin to grasp just even the foundations of the awesomeness of this? It makes your recognition of what it means to be a slave of Christ all the more. It makes your love for Christ resound with joy and expressible. It makes your singing praises to Christ something you've never known before. Those who know God the fullest, 
are absolutely those who can both follow God the closest and worship him the highest. It just makes sense. You think about those in your life. As much as I might love my grandchildren, there is a mother's and father's love that's even greater than mine. They know them to the fullest extent. Now, I might spoil them. I might enjoy them in different ways. But there is a knowledge and love that comes through that nearness that is greater than anything else. In the same way, we who know God and his gospel that he in fact did willingly take on flesh and, and turn loose of the glory that was his before the foundation of the world. That he would willingly submit himself to sinful men to suffer. That he would bear the wrath of the Father and the rejection which you and I deserved. If we would understand and make it our labor to understand this gospel, we ourselves would be set apart. Our, our praises would be higher than they've ever been. Our, our knowledge in, in life of obedience would be greater than we've ever experienced. We must know these truths. He was like no other man ever. And this is proven. He was declared the Son of God with power. When he who was born in the flesh just like you and I died in the flesh just like we shall. But then he defeated death from the inside out unlike any of us. We think if we cure cancer or AIDS or remove poverty or somehow reduce carbon emissions, or do some great thing. We're going to save the world, brothers and sisters. We're not. We can't. It's broken. It's going to stay broken until he restores it with the promises he's given through the one whom he's given. He defeated death unlike any other human being ever. He was declared in the doing that he was, and he is the Son of God, who took on flesh for that purpose, Think about this. This question comes up, wait a second. How, how can one man in his suffering for six hours and in, in his death, how can that bring about justification for every man who would believe sins? How is that possible? How is it that his, this man's time on the cross and his death was sufficient to pay for my sins, which would take me eternity and never be able to pay. How is it sufficient that it can pay for the worst of humanity's sins? That the greatest thief and murderer and, and adulterer that's ever existed, that the grace of Christ, that the cross of Christ is sufficient for their eternal life. How is that possible? Well, if he was just a great man, it's not. He was no ordinary man. He was God's own son. And we need to understand this from scripture. He did not become that in the taking on of flesh. He was that. He was begotten by the father according to the spirit in the taking on of flesh. In the becoming a man, he veiled his deity with flesh, laying aside, aside the glory which was his from the beginning. John 17. And he took it up again while also keeping his flesh for eternity. It's, it's mind-boggling and it's fully beyond our ability to understand in any way that is complete. And through his resurrection, this truth was declared or proven about him. Oh, you think he was just a carpenter from Nazareth? Watch this. Oh, you think you've won by nailing him to a cross and seeing him die? Watch this. Oh, you think you've finished the work that, that you set out to begin and you've protected what you believe to be good and tolerant? Watch this. And he did. He walked out of the grave. Hebrews says that he's a trailblazer, that he went ahead of us through the skies, declaring or, or putting before us a path for which all who follow after him can follow all the way to where he is. This is a great mystery. It is beyond mere mortal man's full grasp. But clearly it is declared by God about Jesus and through his resurrection. How can the death of Jesus accomplish all that Christianity claims it does? Because he was no mere man. That's what the resurrection declares about him. Well, who was he? <laughs> 
Who is he to us? Look at what Paul says at the end of that verse. He is Jesus Christ, our Lord. When you consider what the, the New Testament teaches in regards to the receiving of the, this gospel, this good news of Christ, the picture that's given is, is sometimes it's become very muddled in our time. There's this idea that somehow that, that I make Jesus Lord of my life. Right, we hear that all the time. You just have to make Jesus Lord. Have you made Jesus Lord of your life? Brothers and sisters, that is blasphemy. Amen. It is not biblical. Jesus is Lord. He is Lord over all creation. His authority is given him by none, none of us. None of us make him Lord over us. He is Lord. That's what Paul says in Philippians 2. He is Lord. And here there is a day coming when every knee and every tongue will bow and confess this truth. Whether they receive it or not, it is still yet true. I don't make Jesus Lord of anything. But by the truth of the gospel, I recognize him as Lord. I surrender and submit myself humbly to him in the lordship that I recognize he already has. And in that surrender, that belief over the finished work of the gospel, he becomes my savior. He is every man, every creature's Lord. But he is only savior to those who believe and recognize his lordship, submit themselves to it, and receive him as that. That's what the gospel is. That's the good news. And it's become this great controversy in our time, this lordship of Jesus. As though somehow Jesus himself didn't repeatedly say, why do you call me Lord and yet you don't do what I say? In 1 John it was written entirely so that we might know that we are his and continually throughout the book of 1 John there's this continual recognition of if you say that you are in him but do not obey the things he said, the truth is not in you and you're a liar. John didn't cut any, mince any words, and neither should we. He is Lord. Is he your Lord? You don't make him that, but you do surrender to him, having recognized that's who he is. Have you surrendered to Christ as Lord so that you may then call him Savior? Or have you tried to reverse that? And you want to figure out how to make him your savior and someday maybe he'll be your Lord. It doesn't work that way. It never has and it never will. And that's what Paul is saying. He's saying this Jesus is no ordinary man. He is the second person of the triune God. He is God himself and all the mystery that surrounds that. And he willingly laid down that on your behalf and came and took on flesh. Not just flesh, but he became as a slave. Not just as a slave, but he himself took the punishment that every one of us deserve. No ordinary man could do that. No ordinary man would do that. Who is he? He's our Lord. And any claim otherwise robs Christ of his deity and thus robs him of any power to forgive sins and to save. If he's not the Lord Almighty, if he's not the King of Kings robed in frail humanity, then his death on the cross is insufficient for our sins. It's insufficient for the thief who was next to him it's insufficient for every person who claims belief in him. It is insufficient to save any man. Even if he lived the most perfect life possible, it would still only be applied to himself. It's through his deity, through his lordship, through those things that he laid aside willingly that we ourselves receive the benefit of. This brings us to our final question for this morning. What does this mean for me? This is the final question for someone who believes, right? This is, this is when someone's gone through, well, how do you know that this good news is the good news? Well, how exactly does this good news work? How is it accomplished? Is that really enough? Is it sufficient? How can it be sufficient? These are wonderful, necessary, continuing, ongoing, generation to generation questions that have been asked, are being asked, and will be asked. And we must have the answer. Yes. 
And we do have the answer. Maybe we should put it that way. We do have the answer. And that leads to, okay, what does this mean for me? And Paul answers this question when it seems to plague so many who profess to receive Christ as their Lord and Savior. Look at verses 5 to 7. Through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his name's sake. Among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. To all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Very simply, what now for those who have believed and thus received the good news of his son, Jesus Christ? Grace and peace. Grace and peace is yours to the fullest. Here's the, the thing that we oftentimes miss in this. What happens is through the power of the Spirit, we're born again. We're washed by regeneration through the power of the Spirit. Titus 3 tells us that. We're, we're, we're born again. John chapter 3, the Lord in dealing with Nicodemus declares these necessary truths, these necessary realities of what God accomplishes. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul says, you're a new creation. This is the work that God has finished in you. And what that does is it gives us access. It gives us the grace that turns us unto Christ. We're made into a new creation in the sense that our desires are changed. But we're still stuck in this flesh which is stained by this world. This earthly tent which is going to suffer death because sin is still real. And in that we have an eternal life, a hope beyond that. But in the meantime... <coughs> In the meantime, what is it that, that we're to do and how do we receive that? So many people talk about the, the, the peace that passes understanding. And it's this idea that it's like some Holy Spirit infusion or cocktail that we have to imbibe into ourselves that's going to give us a nirvana experience. And that's not true at all. The peace that passes understanding is as we grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ that begins with our conversion, our new creation. The more that we know about him, the less this world can touch us. The more that we know his promises rooted and grounded in his character, which is proven, the more our hope is eternal and we can face death, we can face suffering, we can face temptation, we can face these struggles, we can face our failures, and we can do so through the love of God, which has been poured out, lavished upon us. That's the peace that passes understanding, and it comes through growing in the maturity and the grace and knowledge of our Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. If you think you're going to take a shortcut and that somehow by listening to praise music day in and day out and never opening this, never desiring to obey this, never pursue growth and maturity through the labor of running the marathon that is our faith, you are sadly and sorely mistaken. And you will not have peace. You will just be like the world having substituted money and sex and pleasure and everything else with some idea of my faith is going to be the substitute for those things to give me that which I desire rather than my faith is the avenue by which I will experience something different than anything this world ever offered me. Grace from God establishes something very specific. When you say I have grace from God, what you're saying is that you also have peace with God. It's a major theme Paul will continually bring before us throughout this epistle. One example is found in Romans chapter 5 verse 1 where he having just declared the good news of God and the freeness of it and the gift nature of it says this in verse 1, Therefore, or in light of these things, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. That's the peace that passes understanding. That you know that whatever this world does to you, as John said earlier, Pastor John said earlier, a billion and one years from now, it will just have begun. It will just have begun. When you have that view, then what can mere man do to you? When you have that view, what fear of death still exists within you? When you have that view, you can say with Paul, it is better to depart and be with him. I love the accounts of the missionaries who have served in horribly difficult places and the one about the old man who was threatened with death for believing and preaching the gospel and they literally put a gun to his head and this old man laughed and he says, you can't threaten me with heaven. That's what we receive. That is the, the defeat of the fear of death that has strangled humanity and caused us to continue in our sin and hope in other things for all of these millennia and years. This is what Christ gives us, peace with God. My eternity is established. 
It is set in stone. It is written on his hands in his blood and nothing can touch that. But this is not a peace wherein we sit idly by and wait for it. This is also a calling that has been placed upon us. Paul uses the term here, he says, apostleship. You've been given grace and apostleship. And we have to touch on this because it's so confusing today. It could be that Paul is describing his own office in verse 5, whereby having received his grace and his apostleship that he began this, this intro with, he uses it to bring about obedience and faith to the Gentiles as he's declared himself to be the apostle to the Gentiles. This is possible. The grammar allows for it. The theological construct is not in contradiction to other things in Scripture. But there's one thing he says. He says, we have received. He says, we have received. And it's more likely that he's speaking in general terms to that which all believers receive through Jesus Christ our Lord. And you'll notice throughout Scripture, this term apostle is applied to others, such as as Barnabas is called an apostle. There are those at the conclusion of this letter who Paul will call an apostle. And that term apostle in the general sense means one who is sent or, or messenger with a purpose. And in this application, if that is what he's saying... He is not talking about the special office of apostle given to the 13 men in the book of Acts. More specifically, he's, but more specifically to the fact that all who receive the gospel are sent with the good news of God to others. We don't simply receive grace and then sit on it. That's wicked. That's why you put it in human terms. If you had the cure for cancer and you sat on it, How wicked would that be? And that's temporal life. The eternal life cure. You can't sit on it. You can't receive it and not share it. It's not possible. You cannot be forgiven and not extend forgiveness. You cannot have received mercy and not yourself share that mercy. We are those who are commanded to go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, and teaching them obedience to all that Jesus has commanded. And lo, he is with us always, and his authority that has been established goes with us all that we go. This meshes meshes well with verses 6 and 7, where where he designates them as the called of Jesus Christ and the beloved of God in Rome who are called as saints. They are the set-apart ones. We are the set-apart ones unto his glory for his name's sake alone. I love how Paul ends this introduction of himself. And I'll tell you that tonight we're going to continue this into understanding what it means that we are beloved of God and how that affects us in our view of him. But here he ends this introduction of himself to these Roman brothers and sisters who many of them had never met him by reminding them of all that they have in God's good news for and to them. He tells them, you are the beloved of God. You are called as saints. Grace and peace be upon you. This is the good news of God to all who are beloved by him. Is it your good news yet? Have you yourself come to the recognition and conclusion of the bad news that this world only offers? To ask these questions. We don't want blind faith. God doesn't call us to blind faith. He says, ask your questions. I have an answer. Ask your questions and look to see the answer. Let us reason together in regards to these things. He will not be found lacking. I promise you. His answers are sufficient. And none others are. And for we who have received, who have, who have recognized that and trusted in the Lord... Are we ourselves renewed regularly in these truths? Do we still fear and stand in awe and reverence of the Lord who saved us? Do we recognize him in the fullness of who he is and that his wrath is being poured out in such a way that we would with urgency share with those whom are around us the good news of salvation from his wrath? They, that they might have peace with God because we ourselves know this peace and love this peace and want others to share in this peace. I want to give you something. It's been very helpful to me. It's from a a pastor who spoke here several years ago, Pastor Kent Hughes. And there's a helpful means from the most well-known verse in the history of the Bible that he uses to, to remind himself of this truth. 
If you're a believer here today, we need reminding. We're going to partake of communion tonight in remembrance of the gospel of God poured out through his son, Jesus Christ. In John 3.16, listen to how he breaks this down. He says, For God, the greatest lover, so loved the greatest degree, the world, the greatest company, that he gave the greatest act, his only begotten son, the greatest gift, that whosoever the greatest opportunity believeth the greatest simplicity in him the greatest attraction should not perish the greatest promise but the greatest difference have the greatest certainty everlasting life the greatest possession we are loved by God brothers and sisters and he has proven it. We are called as saints. Not because we are saints. But saints because we are called. We're, to, we're called. Not because we love him. But because he loved us. What a reason we have to sing his praises. Even this morning. Would you pray with me? Lord. You are the only worthy thing of our lives. Of our praise. And Lord, you are even so far beyond worthy that it's sometimes unfathomable and I think it hinders us in our belief to imagine that you can be all that you are and yet would love such a one as myself. Lord, it's what brought us to places to sing amazing grace that would save a wretch like ourselves. It, it brought John Newton to the book, the Wesley brothers when they wrote, And Can It Be? How is this possible that you would love one such as I? Lord, this is the good news. The gospel of God. And we thank you that you've recorded it, that you've preserved it, that you've given it to us generation after generation. So that we might in fact have the answers and live the hope unto eternity that you put before us. Lord, we thank you for these things. In Christ's name we do so. Amen. Amen. I invite you to stand as